Paris, the early 1870s. The capital of the 19th century is entering the modern age. The times are changing, not least in art. One of those searching for new expression in the new age is the young painter Pierre-Auguste Renoir. The colors, the light, the way paint is applied to the canvas visible in its texture. The new painting style that will soon be called Impressionism breaks with centuries of tradition. It also seeks out new subject matter, ordinary people enjoying pleasures traditionally reserved for the nobility. These pictures strike the public as radically new. But Renoir himself sees them differently. His impressionist paintings are monuments to modern life, but also echoes of an era long past. The railway, a symbol of modern life. To the Impressionists, a subject of art. To Parisians, a comfortable mode of transport for an excursion to the countryside. For example, from the Gare Saint-Lazare to Chateau, where the Seine meanders in a loop to the west of Paris. Without these day-trippers on the Seine, some of Renoir's most famous Impressionist works would never have been painted. Originally, this was a place where people built boats, hired them out, repaired them, and took them apart to repair others. I'm going to show you a remarkable boat. It's called the Zambèze, and it dates from Renoir's time. Here is the beautiful Zambèze, a really lovely boat, very elegant. You might see it in several of Renoir's paintings, notably one called Horseman at Chateau, which is now in Washington, D.C. This painting is called Oarsman at Chateau, and it's done in 1879. What it pictures is a middle-class couple probably come out from the center of Paris on a Sunday afternoon for a, a, a lovely afternoon together, a romantic afternoon on the Seine, boating. People in love in a boat together in this sort of encapsulated space floating on the water. This kind of experience is relatively new for French people. A boat had to be beautiful too. You should really see it the right way up. It's magnificent. It must have been wonderful to see a lovely lady seated in the boat with a handsome oarsman. The women sat in these boats in their dresses. Just imagine. It must have been a splendid sight, sumptuous. One of the radical things about this large picture is how sketchy in feel it is, like really like a sketch. The painting of the sailboat on the river, I mean, it really looks like an afterthought or he wasn't quite sure where he wanted the sailboat to be, but he leaves it. 
And then, of course, color. I mean, my gosh, the palette is really outlandish. I just can't imagine for the people of the time, they must have been absolutely horrified at how bright, how lurid, really, how lurid the colors are. How Renoir paints is shocking enough for his contemporaries. But then there's who he paints. Neither society nobles nor gods from mythology. Just ordinary Parisians having a nice Sunday out. Everyone looking at these oarsmen will see a 19th century subject, pure and simple. And so it is. But artists also make efforts to put filters over their works. They paint in awareness of a tradition. Renoir says of himself that he's an 18th century figure, four square in the great painting tradition of the 18th century. And Renoir played with these references, and he fully intended them to be noticed. Renoir did not invent the motif of a couple in love taking a boat trip. The French Rococo artist Jean-Antoine Watteau had portrayed it over a century before in his embarkation for Cythera. We're in a fantastical park landscape, and here in the foreground is a group of ladies and gentlemen in elegant and refined dress. The story is about these three cousins who are to be married. Their being invited to board the boat, escorted by Cupids and Putti, for the voyage over to the island of Scythera, which we see in the blue haze of the background. That's the island of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. We have the figures, the boat, the Cupid's welcoming committee. Obviously, in up-to-date Paris of the late 19th century, the Cupids disappear. Instead, there's just this man inviting the ladies and gentlemen to board the boat to voyage to a distant island, which might just be the other bank of the River Seine. Watteau painted no fewer than three versions of the embarkation for Cythera. One that was already famous in Renoir's day has hung in the Louvre since the 18th century. Renoir first saw it there in his youth, and he referred back to it again and again. I try to look at this painting as Renoir might have seen it or understood it for the first time. He's looking for certain poetic atmospheric effects that he feels in Watteau's work. This is a highly evocative and enigmatic painting with the intention of rendering a realistic scene poetic and abstract. Renoir's paintings, which portray scenes of merrymaking in the environs of Paris, are more prosaic. The Ancien Regime is over, but we can still take from some of the best parts of 18th century culture and bring them into modernity. All great artists, in my opinion, as an art historian, in order to make the new and to lead into the future, they get inspiration from, from the past. Renoir is one of the inventors of Impressionism. But he also sees his Impressionist works as building on the achievements of the old masters of a previous age. Renoir is living in a society undergoing fundamental change, where the advance into modernity blends with a recourse to old traditions. And it's this apparent contradiction that will shape his painting. Renoir is three years old when, in 1844, his parents move the family from Limoges to Paris. They are part of the flood of workers and craftspeople entering the capital from the provinces, hoping for a better life. The population of Paris will soon top two million. Auguste Renoir grows up in the shadow of the Louvre, where he will later be a regular visitor. The family moves into the Rue de la Bibliothèque. At this point, their neighbor in the Palais des Tuileries is still the king. 
Three days before Renoir's seventh birthday, furious citizens pour through the streets of his neighborhood, heading for the royal palace. Revolution breaks out. Barricades go up all over Paris. Renoir's home district, too, sees its share of street battles. The revolutionaries depose Renoir's royal neighbor and proclaim a republic. Shortly before Renoir's 11th birthday, the president of the republic, a nephew of Napoleon I, carries out a coup and declares himself emperor. For the second time in its history, France becomes an empire. The new emperor calls himself Napoleon III, and with his prefect, Baron Haussmann, he sets out to change the face of Paris. One of the first major building projects is right on Renoir's doorstep, the expansion of the Louvre. Renoir grew up in the Paris in the throes of transformation, a transformation he actually regrets. He's nostalgic for medieval Paris, the Paris of the 17th and 18th centuries. Some of the districts where he used to live were destroyed by the modernization of Paris. The Renoir family street is torn down to build the extension of the Rue de Rivoli along the new north wing of the Louvre. The family moves, but not far, to the Rue d'Agenteuil. Like his parents, Renoir's new neighbors are among the hundreds of thousands of workers and craftspeople employed in small workshops to produce the kind of luxury goods that only the nobility and the privileged elite can afford in the Second French Empire. At the age of 13, Auguste Renoir starts training to become a porcelain painter. It was probably a family decision. To be a porcelain painter is already a step up in this world of Parisian workers. Renoir may also have made his own choice, because he's attracted by painting, and as he's decorating porcelain pieces, he's able in a way to take his first steps as a painter. These are design ideas for his work as a porcelain painter, uh, which is the first job, basically, that he has in Paris. He's copying, basically, probably prints, reproductive prints. Um, and so there's one in particular that is fairly exact in its appearance on a porcelain that we know. The Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris holds a hard-paced porcelain vase on which Auguste Renoir has painted this Bacchant figure on the white porcelain. This work of porcelain painting teaches him drawing and earns him money. He comes from a working-class family that can't afford to pay for drawing lessons, so everything he learns, he learns on the job. Renoir spends four years as an apprentice, painting images on porcelain that will sell well for his employer, motifs inspired by 18th century painting. There were many porcelain painting studios promoting 18th century style decor in the Paris of the Second Empire. Products were aimed at the middle class, the haute bourgeoisie, and sold in the stores of Paris. Huge numbers of these pieces were made in Paris at that time. Thus, at a young age, Renoir was getting to know the old masters who had gone before him, especially those of the Rococo movement. What is Rococo Malerei? What is Rococo painting? We can define the dates as between 1715 and 1780. Of course, a great many artists were working in this period, but the most established artists best known to us today were Antoine Watteau, Boucher, Fragonard and Chardin, and they became the definition of Rococo painting in the 19th century, with enormous influence on artists, collectors and art critics. The history of Paris between the Rococo period and the Second Empire was one of great turmoil. 
four regime changes, the onset of industrialization and the rush into an accelerating modern world. The rediscovery of the Rococo painters, initially by a small avant-garde of critics and writers, was also a return to a French tradition. They were, in some ways, a sort of elite outsider taste. Gradually, in the 1850s and 60s, there is a huge change in the fortunes of these Rococo artists, and they become the most desired among old masters for the very wealthy collectors. And so there is something called the Rococo revival in taste. For Renoir, it's just a five-minute walk from his parents' apartment to the Louvre, where, in the early 1860s, construction work was continuing on the southern facade. Here, he can see the original paintings of the old masters. The way in leads through the new Pavillon des Noms. Young Renoir, who is already very attracted to visual art, is running over to the Louvre. And so he was going constantly to the Louvre and, uh, and would continue to do that. That became a practice for him throughout his career. He didn't just go and, you know, learn uh, old master painting there and then stop and become a modernist. He continued to reference the, the beautiful masterpieces in the Louvre. In 1860, Renoir acquires a copyist's card an official permit to paint copies of works in the Louvre. This is quite a symbolic date because now the museum starts presenting its collections of 18th century French painting in rooms specifically intended for those works. 1860 is also the year of a big private initiative, a major exhibition of 18th century French art at the Galerie Martinet. This exhibition is a tremendous success, gets a lot of press and visitors. We don't know for sure that Renoir went, but it's very likely that he did. At least, he certainly heard people talk about it. You know, once Renoir decides that he wants to be a professional artist, the next step, and it's very structured in Paris and has been structured for 200 years, is to, is to go to the École des Beaux-Arts. And there's a concours, there's a competition to gain admittance. And so he does that and he gets in. You know, Renoir is very dutifully going through the system of training. Renoir encounters completely new influences. He also attends a private painting studio, as is common practice, where he meets Claude Monet and Frédéric Bazille. Renoir, with his uncompromising comrades in arms, finds inspiration everywhere in his search for a new way of painting. He has a love of life and a great urge to soak in everything he perceives and senses, as his son will later say of him. We don't actually know Renoir's thinking in the 1860s. We have a sense of him in his mid-twenties deciding that this will be his route as a, a member of some sort of new painting. He has very little obligations. He's able to make quite a lot of money through his decorative works. He's able to put himself through school. And early on in the 1860s, he begins to make portraits as commissioned works while doing more in a way, larger subject pictures, potentially for the market. I have shown Lise and Sisley at Carpentier's. I am trying to earn a hundred francs from it, wrote Renoir to his friend Bazille about his painting The Betrothed, which depicts his lover Lise Tréau and his painter friend Alfred Sisley as a loving couple. One hundred francs. Not even enough for a month's rent of a furnished room on the Boulevard Montmartre, where the art dealer Carpentier, who was to sell the painting, had his premises.
Renoir can't afford his own studio in the 1860s, unlike his friend Frédéric Bazy. When Bazy paints his studio, he includes Renoir in it, in the left-hand corner under the stairs. Renoir has moved in with his friend. I think he was the least affluent. Uh, Monet would have been closest, and he was um, really from a, a middle-class family up on the English Channel. Basile, very wealthy family from Montpellier, his best friend. I don't know what those two, Renoir or Monet, would have done, honestly, without Basile in that decade. Standing at the easel, the man in the hat is Édouard Manet, a pioneer in the quest for a new way of painting, for which the word impressionism has yet to be coined. What is radically new about Impressionism when it emerges publicly in the mid-1870s? I think it's the combination of three things. A touch that evades the finish and wants to be fast. Modern subjects. And the affirmation of the artist's liberty and subjectivity. These three together, in my opinion, are what's new about Impressionism and the disruption it triggers. You know, images of ancient mythology and from the Bible and from French history, these are not that interesting right now. What you guys need to be doing is picturing this epic moment. Everything that leads to this, this extraordinary experience, which is called modernity. And so I think, you know, Impressionism really comes out of that ethos. Renoir spends the summer of 1869 west of Paris in the village of Louvciennes, where his parents now live. From here, he writes to Bazy, I am with my parents and almost always with Monet. I am very happy because when it comes to painting, Monet is good company. Monet is lodging in a nearby village. He too writes to Bazy, I have a dream, a painting, of the bathers at La Grenière. Renoir, who is spending two months here, also wants to paint it. Ah, La, ah, La Grenière, that's the spot for adventure. A tavern hidden away in the trees. It's at Croissy, a kilometre from here, but secluded. Renoir and Monet paint side by side on the Seine. It's one of the key moments of Impressionism. We're approaching the site of La Granouillère. You can identify it from the little shingle beach that makes a white mark. In Renoir's time, the site was a bit different. There was a little islet off the bank, connected by little footbridges. There were floating barges, very inviting for a drink. People bathed there, and you could dance. The radical departure in La Grenouillère is the choice of subject, a place of entertainment, of recreation, typical of how 19th century society was developing. Also, the fragmentation of the touch, the freedom of the brushwork and the juxtaposition of colors, and of course the idea that painting can capture life as it's lived, not as a reconstruction in the studio, that it's really an immediate effect. That's important. La Grenouillère presents a scene that refers to reality. This is a painting by Jean-Honoré Fragonard of women bathing. It was painted in about 1770. 
The Fragonard painting is a dreamscape. There's something fairy-like about it. What fascinated Renoir's contemporaries in Fragonard's paintings when he was rediscovered in the 1860s, and especially in this painting, The Bathers, was his facture, his execution, his touch as he seeks to capture the fluttering immediacy of the moment. In this painting, Fragonard's touch is extremely fragmented, dynamic. Its effect is to disrupt forms and, in the process, to lend them more vigor. And I think that had a profound impact on the young painters like Renoir, who were trying to achieve the same effects in the 1860s. This touch that's completely diffused and fragmented to bring out the light and the painted subject, yes, that's Impressionism. Renoir dedicates himself wholeheartedly to the new era, but he will continue to cherish the old masters. Renoir denied that Impressionism represented a break with the past. He always said that Impressionism fitted into a tradition especially of the 18th century. I think the Impressionists, especially Renoir, exhibit a knowing balance between a freedom of painterly gesture, a new way of painting and approaching motifs, and a loyalty to a certain taste, particularly of Watteau, Fragonard and Boucher, artists whom Renoir so deeply admired. Renoir also spends the next summer on the banks of the Seine. In La Promenade, he portrays his lover Lise Tréau in an impressionistic adaptation of a favourite Rococo theme also found in the paintings of Jean-Antoine Watteau, Lovers on a Forest Path. La Promenade, La Promenade is a remarkable painting. This work, painted in 1870, shows Renoir's clearest ever reference to Rococo painting by effectively, one might say, taking a detail from a Watteau painting and using it to portray an elegant couple. It looks as though they've just disembarked from a boat. The young man's clothes also suggest he's an oarsman. Maybe they've just landed on Scythera, the island of love. Looking at this shore, you have to imagine a little grassy beach with shallow water. In some places, like this, it was quite easy to ground the boat and help the lady out. But of course, she didn't want to get her dress muddy, so she'd have to lift it a little. Imagine such a daring thing to lift your dress, and then vanishing off into the green, into nature, to stroll and exchange sweet nothings. Studying this painting, we notice how Renoir left his illusions so open, just like the 18th century painters. So we don't know where the couple are going or where they've come from. This is one of the outstanding achievements of Impressionism. It establishes a dialogue with us, the viewers, who engage with the painting. It invites us to continue the story for ourselves. The idyll of the summer of 1870, which Renoir evokes in his painting A Road in Louvre-Sienne, is shattered. To the complete surprise of most people in France, war breaks out between the Second French Empire and Prussia. The battles seem a world away from Louvre-Sienne. But suddenly, to the astonishment of a France certain of victory, German armies are on French soil. Renoir himself is an army reservist and has to enlist. He's assigned to a cavalry regiment in the south of France, 
but falls ill and spends the war far from the battlefields. It's only from afar that he learns that the Emperor of France has been deposed following a disastrous defeat and that a republic has been declared in the Paris Hôtel de Ville in the midst of the war. And that the German armies have encircled Paris, imposing months of siege and then bombarding the city. And how the war only comes to an end when Paris faces starvation after a bitterly cold winter. It's not until after the war that Renoir discovers that his friend Frédéric Bazy, who had volunteered for the army, was killed in his very first battle. Returning to Paris in the spring of 1871, Renoir finds himself in the turmoil of civil war. Paris, at the war's end, is a city full of weapons. Many Parisians, especially in the working-class districts, refuse to accept the defeat and ceasefire. They feel betrayed by their own government. When the government tries to evacuate artillery from Montmartre, the people declare a commune. The communards seek a political and property revolution. A bloody civil war pitting French men and women against each other ends in the commune's defeat. After the battles, photographers in Paris are busy recording the devastation in the wake of war and civil war. But the Impressionists are seeking other subjects. Let's put ourselves in the place of a painter rather than perhaps an art historian or a, um, or a historian. When they begin to paint again, they are not necessarily f thinking about the, 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 the terrible years that have happened, we can't know what sort of private trauma they may have experienced. What we see is a desire to return to some normalcy and in a way to build on the experiments and the, and the particular um, areas in which they had made progress before the war. After the war, the Second Empire is history. Paris is now the capital of the Third French Republic. In the summer of 1872, at the Pont Neuf, on the first floor of a building overlooking the bridge, Renoir sits in a cafe and gazes out of the window. He makes sketches of the comings and goings on the bridge and takes them back to the first studio he can call his own. There, in a single day, he paints his large format work, Pont Neuf. To think of Renoir painting an incredibly sort of jubilant and positive and glowing, glittering picture of the city that had been under such duress just one year after, I can't imagine that anybody's not thinking about that when they're looking at, at him painting this. The light is incredible. It's a beautiful sunny day, a breezy day, sort of le tout Paris. Everybody is out on the street. There's a, a soldier. Uh, from, from the army, um, wearing the, the same uniform that soldiers wore during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, we think this is Edmond Renoir, uh, Auguste's brother, walking along with a cane, and he's got a little dog and a wonderful straw boater. Flower sellers, this woman is pushing a, a cart, um, and people are carrying bouquets. Um, it looks like maybe a boulanger carrying some bread and a basket on his head. Another workman carrying vegetables. I love over here in the corner this beautiful little very quickly dashed off mother with her beautifully dressed daughter carrying a parasol. But just, you know, different classes mixing up together. The working class, soldiers, dandies, um, and the middle class. So it's this mix that I think is part of the energy of Paris. This mix of peoples all together on the boulevard. The former communard back in the driver's seat on his cart. The bourgeoisie flush with new money, aping the habits of the old nobility. The washerwoman enjoying her Sunday off at a dance cafe. And the flaneur sporting an oarsman's cap on an excursion to Chateau to boat with his beloved. 
Renoir will portray this Parisian mix, assembling it into grand figural compositions. He moves among all social classes of the New Republic and meets everyone with the same empathy. Renoir spends the summer of 1876 in Montmartre. Montmartre is not yet an artist's quarter, but a working-class district, still almost a village. Renoir rents a coach house in the Rue Coteau. There's space for his canvases and easels on the ground floor, with a two-room apartment upstairs. Just a few streets away from the coach house is a dance cafe where Renoir and his friends are regulars. He decides to paint a large work on location, the dance at Le Moulin de la Galette. Renoir carries his huge canvas back and forth with the help of his friends and to the great amusement of his neighbours, who've never seen anything quite like this. So the main entrance was on the other side, from where you came back inside, and most of the dancing took place here. Here we are in the garden of the Moulin de la Galette. On my left, you have the Moulin Radé, and down there, the Moulin Boutefin. The two windmills together comprise the Moulin de la Galette. Running a venue like this in 1876, I think it would have been very different, but probably very enjoyable. You have to imagine a real mix of artists, haute bourgeoisie, people of all persuasions, rogues, ladies of the night. It must have been fun. I'd like to have worked in that era to experience it. That would have been quite interesting. The public cavorting at the Sunday dance at the Moulin de la Galette might well also have attended this fair in Montmartre. Flower girls, factory workers, seamstresses, apprentice craftsmen, working class families from the neighborhood. And mixing in among them, artists, actresses, and thrill seekers from the middle class districts. It's an everyday, popular scene, but done on the scale of a history painting. That means it's an ambitious and noble format. So that's already new, treating ordinary subjects as noble. It's a sea change that's difficult to detect from our perspective today, but the public of Renoir's time was highly sensitive to it. In the foreground, at the far right of the group at the table, wearing a summer hat, is Renoir's friend, the critic Georges Rivière. He calls the dance at Le Moulin de la Galette a monument to la vie parisienne. Another critic compares Renoir to his great idol, Jean-Antoine Watteau. Being compared with the great master of the 18th century was obviously a great accolade for Renoir, especially because Renoir saw Impressionism not as revolutionary, but as faithful to the tradition. He must have been thrilled that people understood him like that. Watteau's embarkation for Cythera had founded a new genre in the early 18th century, the Fête Galante, the courtship party. 
Alors, qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une fête galante eh bien, What is a fête galante It's a party where people indulge in highly refined, highly sophisticated and highly privileged forms of play. Watteau's fête galante portray a world of the nobility, but in a way that seems remote from reality, like a fairy world. The paintings of Watteau depict a way of life that was highly artificial. But the first 19th century critics who rediscovered his works thought of them as a kind of reportage on the lives of the elites of the 18th century. That's a bit of a fallacy, but even so, it's a way of understanding this painting as a reflection of festive fashions in Parisian life. In Watteau's paintings, the nobility is at leisure in a fairy world. In Renoir's, citizens of all classes are at leisure in Montmartre. The difference between Embarcation for Cythera and the Moulin de la Galette is that there's no otherworldly element. Bliss isn't some imagined future state. It's here and now. Even so, I find that both paintings share a fairy-like atmosphere. For Renoir, I think the magic comes from the light, the brushwork, the color, and the conviviality. It's a dream of harmony. We shouldn't forget, though, that this is only a few years after the Commune, and we're in one of the very places where it was crushed. This painting comes after a bloody period of political turmoil, but Renoir shows us a society reconciled. Renoir presents his Dance at Le Moulin de la Galette at the third independent group exhibition organized jointly by the Impressionists. His friend Georges Riviere witnesses a banker making fun of the painting and, egged on by his laughing friends, demanding a refund of his entry fee. Impressionism is still a passion confined to a few avant-gardistes. Most wealthy collectors are not yet ready for it. In 1875 and 1876, they had Impressionist auctions where the group tried to put their works on the market. Renoir had to buy some of his work back. There was so little appetite for them at this point. And so it gives you a certain poignancy that masterpieces in museums today were reviled or ignored or there was simply no demand for them yet among collectors. To make a living, Renoir paints portraits on commission. The salons of the Grand Bourgeoisie on the boulevards of the better districts are not his world. But it's here that people live who can afford to pay a portrait artist like him. So from the 18 early 70s right through to 1885, Renoir does more and more portraits and is actually, has a sort of, something of a reputation as being a portraitist mondaine. Marguerite Charpentier, a wealthy heiress and wife of a publisher, becomes a kind of patron for Renoir. Her salon is frequented by anyone who's anyone in Parisian art and high society. She introduces Renoir to potential clients and has him paint portraits of herself and her two children. Renoir signs a letter to Madame Charpentier, votre peintre ordinaire, your painter in ordinary, as royal artists were known under the Ancien Régime. It's just a fantastic sort of epic portrait of the heart of sort of bourgeois court culture in the Third Republic. So a kind of Madame de Pompadour, you know, updated to Paris in the 1870s. Just as his idols Watteau, Boucher and Fragonard captured the charm and grace of the 18th century, so does Renoir in the 19th, his contemporaries assure him. A Girl Reading by Renoir. And A Girl Reading by Fragonard, painted just over a century before. 
When I look at this painting, the very first thing I think about as a 19th century expert is Renoir in terms of color and touch. And Fragonard is a great genius at creating these color combinations that are so extraordinary. So in this case, this lime yellow, this very sharp yellow with violet, and the way that those two colors play off each other. Also, the great joy that Fragonard takes, as does Renoir in the 19th century, in moving paint around with brushes um, and turning the brush around and scraping into the paint. Renoir layers colors to create a bouquet of flowers. He uses transparent glazes to build up skin, and he adorns his model here with a hat decorated with poppies and ox eye daisies. She's looking past the book at a bouquet that isn't painted in detail at all, but is really just suggested in a profusion of different tones. In loose paint, worked straight from the tube, just applied here against a background painted flat. So we see the motif, the brushwork, and also the idea of following the tradition of an 18th century master. Renoir said of himself that he was painting like Fragonard, only less well. So he was really relating himself directly to Fragonard, not just in terms of motif, but in the way of painting. Renoir is a painter of happiness and beauty, not ugliness. And he stages the moments of happiness too. The elegant clothes and hats, the jewellery, the fine tableware. Everything tells us that we've entered a scene of sociability in bourgeois Paris. We tend to associate Impressionism with reality, to assume that we're being shown a glimpse of everyday life, and that's not the case, certainly not with Renoir. Renoir's painting, After the Luncheon, shows a fictional party. The actors playing their parts are his brother lighting a cigarette, one of Renoir's favourite models, Marguerite Legrand, and the famous actress Hélène André, who also modelled for Monet and Degas. The locale is not the garden of some elegant country restaurant or a patrician family villa, but the terrace of a Montmartre tavern, where people don't generally wear their Sunday best. Just like the painters of the Fête Galante a century before, Renoir is not painting the world as it is, but an idealized version of it. He's showing us a fiction, a fiction of a good life. So we always have to question Impressionism and Renoir to establish the truth of his compositions. The summer of 1880 finds Renoir back on the banks of the Seine at Chateau. On the balcony of the Maison Fournaise restaurant, he paints the luncheon of the boating party. This large painting is called Luncheon of the Boating Party. We know that it was painted in situ. The balcony railings are perfectly recognizable, the perspective somewhat exaggerated to lend depth to the painting and bring out the figures in relief. They nearly seem to jump out of the canvas in three dimensions. Of course, you can see the Seine and its horizon in the distance. You can see the railway bridge with the train from Paris passing by, bringing Parisians on outings and to go boating. You can also see little sails, little rowing boats, the orange and white awning. 
seems like, oh, it's just a, a snapshot of a bunch of friends having fun. But the longer you look, you realize how compositionally brilliant it is. And you can almost trace arabesques throughout the crowd of different people talking to friends and kissing and whispering and gazing and looking. Il va pousser sa peinture et son écriture He uses an impressionist touch for some parts, like the foliage, the landscape, the still life, the little dog. And then he uses a much more classical touch, almost like a glaze, very smooth for the faces, arms and shoulders. Luncheon of the boating party marks the end of his work on large format Parisian scenes. Its depiction of the figures is already much more compact and focused. It no longer has that impressionistic shimmer. The figures are very much drawn and modelled. It displays something he was already exploring in the dance at Le Moulin de la Galette, a snapshot of life, but actually very artfully staged. It's quite a sophisticated picture, a big picture, an ambitious painting. The uh, luncheon of the boating party, you know, absolutely qualifies as a, um, as a fête galante. I would call it a, a, a modernized fête galante. As his son later wrote, Renoir loved fairy tales. The everyday was like a fairy tale to him. His Impressionist paintings are inherently contemporary, but they also echo an era long past. For his own work at least, Renoir always denied that Impressionism was a break with all traditions. In the 1880s, Renoir turned away from Impressionism, now finding it too transient. But his paintings from this period remain monuments of la vie parisienne and a timeless invention of beauty. Mm -hmm.